found out we were going to probably come over here to Europe, so we uh, went to various sites that were under consideration. I remember coming here, and we took a helicopter ride from uh, near the city and, and flew out here and looked down on what was just uh, agriculture. There were beans and various crops growing out here. And we landed, and I remember they had an X, and they said, this is where the castle is going to be. <laughs> you know, and it was, it was so hard to visualize that. And I think the, the challenge that I felt at the start is, you know, I've been involved with projects at Disneyland in California and Florida, Epcot primarily, and uh, we were building in an area in America where, where culture is not a really big thing. And how many of you have actually gone downtown in Orlando or gone downtown to Anaheim? The cities are, you know, nondescript. Whereas coming here to Europe and specifically to Paris, you had this city that was world-renowned culturally and artistically and all of these other aspects. And so how is Disneyland, Disney, going to fit with something so extraordinary as this uh, destination in the world's mind, I think. So that was, it was both a challenge and, uh, and, and daunting. It was very frightening to think about what will play well and what, you know, do we need to really think about. So one of our primary goals at the beginning was that the detail level in this park had to be different from what you'd see in Paris, but compatible in terms of the level of expectation that you'd find if you were shopping or visiting the museums and so forth. Uh, our own brand, but at a level we hadn't normally done. So when I think of the parks, I think of Disneyland in California as very charming. I think of the Florida project as very spectacular. And I think of Disneyland Paris as the most beautiful park that we've ever done. And the detail level, I think, is extraordinary. And as you walk around the park today, think about that, about everywhere you look, there's a, a level of concern and attention that I think is far greater than anything we've ever done. So. I think that was going in. I also remember it was very cold that day. And I thought, what are we going to do to make sure traveling to this park can be a pleasant experience if the weather isn't as beautiful as it is today? I hope you like this, because I brought it from California on the plane last night. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I think there were adjustments throughout the whole park. I remember the sense of arrival that we got when we visited places like uh, Chinosos, Chambord, and over at Versailles, and so forth. There's a sense of giving that you get from the locations that's so beautiful that giving them an admission or something like that is almost like part of it. And in California and so forth, it's more like tickets and so forth, and then you go in. And so we really felt this sense of arrival is far more developed here in, in Europe. So we need to create a grand entrance. And the idea of building that hotel down there Everybody thought we were crazy. You know, this was like we've never done that. You know, all these problems. There were people that had a million problems about having this at the entrance. But I said it's a it's an example of a uh, hospitality. It's a great place that you'd love to uh, uh, arrive at. So the gardens and everything there, while they're all American in terms of the architectural style, I think they're very European in the sense of arrival, which is something that's highly developed here when you go to these exquisite places all over the continent. Uh, there is a, a, a sense of beauty just in the sense of getting out of your car and approaching these places. So more than any other park, I think the entrance here is extraordinary. And ironically, it was a successful thing to have that hotel. And so many of our other parks like Tokyo and even in California with the Grand Californian Hotel at the California Adventure Park, all of that has come as a result of what we pioneered here in, in Paris. Main Street, in Tokyo we covered Main Street because people shop. It's a big part of the culture in, in, uh, in uh, Jap Japan is to take home gifts for literally every friend and relative that you have. In Paris it's more about enjoying the outdoors and, uh, and, and the life that you see when you go to the city. I love the street cafe scene in, in Paris. Everybody is eating outside. Nobody would go into a restaurant if the weather was like this. They'll be outside. So to have covered Main Street the way we did in Tokyo would have been wrong. So culturally, we left it open, but we knew we were going to have weather. So we put in the arcades. If you walk behind Main Street, you'll see two of the most beautiful arcades, I think, in Europe. Um, and yet we were able to maintain that openness on Main Street. I'll just walk around the park quickly. Uh, to give you a few of my highlights, but uh, Big Thunder was one of my earliest jobs as we go to Frontierland now. Um, 
and we, it was always an afterthought. It came at the very end. Frontierland had existed in California and Florida. They had been built, and now what land do we have where we could put Big Thunder? And uh, whereas in Paris, we were starting from you know the ground, and so I said, let's put it right in the center. It's the most important attraction in that park. We'll put it right in the center. And the idea of putting it out on the island, I think, gave us the best Big Thunder there is in the world. Because to get to it, the ride has to go under the water to get out to that island. And at the end, the most spectacular thrill segment we've ever done, to get you back from that island, we have to hit a speed in the, in the darkness that's probably unmatched anywhere on a Disney coaster uh, to get back to the land. So the other thing it did is by being in the center, everywhere you go in Frontierland is enlivened by the excitement and the noise and the sounds uh, and the visuals of those trains running around. It's sort of like the backdrop, whether you're over at Phantom Manor or you're over to the Chaparral stage, you, you've got that context of that, the great scene of the West. When we did a lot of research here in Paris, I would go to bookstores that were not tourist bookstores, but to local uh, people that lived here in the smaller suburbs, and I'd look at what were their impressions of America. And they loved the West, it was very popular, they loved the Native Americans, and that whole what I would call John Ford, the, uh, the great director, we showcase Monument Valley. And so that we knew we were on safe ground because just as to me coming here to look at the beauty of the greenery and the villages and the swans on the rivers and everything is very uh, culturally different than my dry California area, the whole idea of the Monument Valley and that deserty west with cactuses and so forth was very appealing from a European perspective because it was so remote and distant. So we knew we were on safe ground of doing that because to put that kind of a visual only 25, 30 minutes from the city is extraordinary. When you look at that and you say, we are about 40 minutes from the Eiffel Tower and look at this view, it's, it's, it's stunning. And our landscape department goes to the trouble of every year about this time we bring out cactuses and succulents that are kept in storage all winter long because they'd never make it through the winter. Uh, to enhance that, that look. So I'm very proud of the frontier land. When we decided not to do Tom Sawyer Island uh, in Frontierland, which is at the center of all the, the state Disney parks, uh, we decided there's probably a stronger concept in that you know, mythical, tropical island where there's treasures and pirates and castaways and all that. So we created Adventure Isle. Uh, which has everything that we have in the States with Tom Sawyer Island, but it's a little bit more international in scope. We had no idea Disney was going to go and do uh, this series of pirate films that was ideally suited to that kind of an environment. So that's been a, a big bonus plus that Adventure Island really works extremely well for uh, supporting the pirate franchise of films. Um, pirates, I'm, I think this Pirates is very unique in that only in California, where we have no water, were they able to dig the, the, the major portion of that ride deep enough that we could take you down two waterfalls uh, without being below the water tables. And when we got into the topography here, we had the same situation. That if you dig a hole, you've essentially got a, a little pond, you know, very quickly. And so what we did, we came up with reversing the sequence in that ride so we could get you up higher at the beginning, which allowed us to reinstate the second waterfall. So. This attraction and the one in California are the only two pirate rides that have the original amount of thrill that Walt Disney wanted in the uh, initial park. Um, so that's probably, the, the, in, in terms of Adventureland, that was probably the high points there. And moving, I think, to, uh, to uh, Fantasyland, uh, our first thought was we were pretty you know, safe with what we had just done a few years before in Disneyland's Fantasyland, where we kind of brought a little bit of the storytelling outside into the architecture. So each of these facades sort of reflects the cultures, the, the uh, countries that, uh, that those stories kind of belong to. So we're standing right now in a British Toad Hall from Wind in the Willows and Kenneth Graham's story, all the way over to the Italian Bella Note area over there from Disney's film Lady in the Tramp. And so all of these little communities here kind of reflect the broad spectrum across the mainland Europe and in England. But the big challenge was the castle. In California, it's derivative from uh, Neuschwanstein. In Florida, it's the Loire Valley with Chinoso, Chambord, and various other elements that you can pick out on the castle we have in Florida, which is fine. That's 
remote, but we were, you know, Pierre saying, well, we're about 100 miles away from that area, so we're going to have to really go back to the story books and so forth. And one of my inspirations, I think, was Ivan Durrell, who did the classic film Disney release Sleeping Beauty back in the 50s. And we found out there were two or three artists still around in 1992 that helped us out by, um, by bringing in uh, uh, that, that look of painting that they still knew because they worked under Ivan Durrell. So on opening day here, the ticket was designed by um, uh, Frank Armitage, who did uh, background work on the film Sleeping Beauty. And, uh, so we actually, I think, it was our inspirational art that was uh, marketed at the park. We made it into the opening day ticket. Uh, that was sold here. So that inspired everyone to create something that was, again, I use that term, uh, it's uh, not competing with the architecture you'd find in, even down you know, in the city, like Notre Dame and so forth. It's not Gothic per se. It's fairy tale, and so it's compatible or complementary to that. It's something that feels akin, it feels comfortable. The sculptural nature of the trees is very reminiscent of French tapestries, but it's also out of this fairy tale book and then the, the clincher for me was putting a dragon in the basement. I, I thought, you know, what would really distinguish this from any other great monument that you might visit? Uh, I said, well, I don't think any of them have dragons living in the basement. And the, 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 I remember there was a lot of discussion. Well, that isn't going to be capacity. That isn't any of the stuff and, you know, that we measure how many go through the turnstiles. And I said, I just, I just have a feeling about this. So we created the castle in such a way that we had enough uh, you know, re uh, remaining in the budget for that to create that grotto. And I was so proud that when we opened, people would talk about what were their favorite experiences in Paris. Number three, I mean, there was pirates and, and big thunder. Number three was the dragon in the castle. So I said, there you go. That was a wise decision. And Discoveryland, you know, we have this challenge with the future. It was always Tomorrowland in the States. And in the 50s, the future kind of stayed with a constant that lasted maybe 10 or 20 years where we hadn't gone to the moon yet. We hadn't developed the computer. And you could talk about all of these far-reaching things for a long time. But now, as you know, you, you fear buying the new smartphone because six months later, you know, I, I, you know Apple's going to announce the one that you really have to have. So we're all like in the, caught up in this thing of, of always being obsolete. And we thought, now we're going into a different cultural community here. What can we say about the future? And we said to ourselves, we said, okay, what inspired us? And you think of the H.G. Wells's, the Jules Verne's, the Leonardo da Vinci's. Every great scientist probably went through a childhood where those stories were so much a part of their inspiration for going on and to the endeavors of taking us into space or whatever. And so we thought, well, what about then coming up with the idea that dreams, these, these dreams that these great minds created, these dreams have kind of fueled the future. Because every kid that gets inspired by reading those things, that then goes on to do something, um, has really changed the world. So dreams can be the fuel for making the future the way we know it now. So that was the look that we created there, something that might have been, if we brought Leonardo here, he'd probably say that looks like the way I saw the future being, or H.G. Wells, so forth. And yet, it's filled with dreams that can be modified and changed as time goes on. So today, you're going to experience the new Star Wars adventures that have brought us up to date with that universe. Um, so it's it's very flexible, but at the same time, we don't get caught up in like having a, a mid-century modern uh, Tomorrowland, like we, we suddenly found ourselves with it. You know? So. Each of these areas is rich with a lot of thought that went into the conceptualizing on it. Um, and I think, in my way, I, I might have said it already, but I think that of all our parks, this is definitely the most beautiful one. And that was some, a mood that I felt was very compatible with what we're up against down the street. It's not Anaheim, it's not Orlando. This is one of the great cultural milestones in, in human civilization, the city of Paris. So as you go through, like I say, um, those of you, since you're all fans, you've been to all the parks, I think I can guarantee you you'll see more, more detail and level of finesse in this park than uh, literally any, anything we've, we've done. The layout of Bithana Mountain, why is it the same 
as in uh, Florida or Tokyo, for example? Okay, well, the, the layout of Big Thunder is modified to get from the, the station out under the water, and then it's the same. And then when it comes back, it's different. And, but that, that corrected the problem that Florida has and California has, that the last thrill segment is shortened because when you come to the station, there still has to be enough energy to get you down to the start of the ride for the first lift. So we have to give up that amount of thrill in order to get the train out of the station. Whereas here, uh, because you're going under the water, we get more thrill uh, because we don't have to, to deal with that. Uh, so it, it corrected what I thought was you should have a continual, you know, more excitement on each of those drops. So the first one uh, is you know, you have, uh, let's see, we have the spiral view, I believe. You know. No, that's in the second one. The first one has the drop through the splash, and then the second one is the spiral. And then the third one goes down under the water, which is, so they're increasingly more exciting. So the, that's the, this is the only part that has that, because in California, the spiral is the most thrilling part, and then the last one is, is lesser. So we were really proud that we were able to come up with a way to change the layout on that and make it so not only is it continually getting more exciting, but that um, that you can see it from everywhere in that land. So when you're riding the boats or you're walking around, the, the Big Thunder becomes the symbol of the whole frontier land, whereas it was always added <coughs> later to, you know, in Florida to that frontier land, later at Disneyland, and the park was already developed, so it's kind of pushed into a corner. So here is the dramatic centerpiece for the land, and that's the only park, even in Tokyo, it's over in the corner. Um, so this is the only park where you look right through the fort as you go into that land, and it's right there to draw you in is the excitement of Big Thunder. So the placement here is the only park where it was part of the initial opening plan to put it right in, in the center. Now the Boot Hill, are you referring to it being indoors inside of a building uh, as opposed to? Yeah. It's referring to a cover vault. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's going to be a vault and it's appearing in one of the sketches. Yeah, okay. I, I think that was just a rough idea. I don't, it never was uh, taken to any uh, further extreme. A lot of times we do lots and lots of drawings and they edit through and they change. Because originally uh, at Disneyland, the Haunted Mansion ended with a museum of the weird which was just done as a Marvel comic. I don't know if you saw the Marvel uh, comic book a version of Disney's Museum of the Weird, but it was an indoor space where you saw a lot of uh, additional Haunted Mansion things that required you to stand still and look at them. They, weren't, they didn't lend themselves to being put on a ride, so they had this idea that after the ride was over, you'd go into a vault where you would see a collection of strange things and you could stand there and look at them for a long time. They never built it, but Marvel was so excited about the idea of that that they developed a comic book series. I think there's five, five episodes of Disney's Museum of the Weird and that was uh, something for the Haunted Mansion that never happened. So I'm sure what you're referring to was the concept of doing an indoor space because obviously if we can do that, then even on a, a rainy day, it's, it's uh, easy for the guests to enjoy it. But um, it was very early abandoned because I don't remember it being built on any of the models or plans and layouts. Okay, someone else, yes. Uh, for the 20th anniversary, you said you'd love to come back and really complete Discoveryland. Yes. Um, what do you think of the latest evolution of Discoveryland? You know, the stronger Star Tours presence, yeah. and of course, yeah. the Space Mountain arriving in and the Jules Verne Space Mountain that I think is getting all the fans, you know, uh, torn on the idea. Yeah. Uh, where do you think Discoveryland is going, or? What That's like asking where the future is going. <laughs> I, you know, we, you're probably aware of what we're doing in California and in Florida with uh, Star, uh, you know, Star Wars land, and uh, so both of those places are going to have an area as big as Discoveryland that's devoted to the world of the Star Wars. So I think. You'll be able to tell when those attractions open, and I think they just announced 2019. Uh, you'll be able to visit, and if it's as good as I imagine it's going to be, 
then we'll see what happens here. But the interesting thing about the future of our discovery land, we haven't discovered it yet. So I think it, the, mal the flexibility of where that will go, it, it's dependent on sort of what inspires and excites people in the future. You know, so we're probably a, a couple of years away from making that call, but you know, I would I would put my bets that you know something really is exciting and from that development in California and Florida, um, the, you, you know, that could be on the horizon. I don't know. So it's just a question of you know uh, where the world focus and interest about things that are. Uh, you know, otherworldly or futuristic or inspirational, because like I like the idea of dreams fueling the future. So it, it allows us to, you know, put dreams from all different time frames, almost like a time machine, where you you go into that land and it has things coexisting, not in in sense of being designed in the future, but conceptually things that Jules Verne or H. G. Wells dreamt about can reside with things that George Lucas and uh, the guys at Marvel or whoever we're dreaming about, you know, it's all these future thinkers are united by the fact that they kind of suggest things that take us to the next place. And to, you know, to guess right now where that would be is, is difficult. I don't know. So do you think we're still, we're still going with the concept of great minds that envision the future by including basically George Lucas? So I hope so. We're because still keeping the concept yeah, of discovery. Yeah, I mean, like, Think about where we'd all be. Everyone's holding something here that probably Steve Jobs, if he weren't who he was, they wouldn't have that, you know. So exactly. And I worry about Apple when you know when Steve is not with us anymore. So who, who's the one coming up with these brand new? I can't live my life if I don't have this new thing. Uh, so I think all of these people have a, a, their brains are wired the same way that they they think about things that we can't think about until we have them. You know, and, and their minds are, you know, I, I'm delighted with people like Elon Musk, who's at uh, Tesla, and he's got all these rocket things that are going up, taking parcels up to the space station, and uh, even Branson, you know, if he ever gets this off the ground and is taking people into outer space, uh, you know, those are all inspiring minds, and until they're successful, they're just people with wild ideas that we don't take seriously, but then all of a sudden, when they're you know, productized or realized, then all of a sudden it's like, well, there's, there's where we're going to go. So it's very hard to speculate about that, but um, I'm sure that there's going to be continued new minds that think that way that will kind of guide that. And I think it's safer to base it on that type of thinking rather than trying to say, like, Frontierland is a certain place and time, and Fantasyland is, is once upon a time long ago. Uh, but the, the future and the idea of dreaming is something that can span from long ago to way up into the future. And I think that, if we keep that in mind, it accommodates a lot of really interesting things. So I didn't tell you what you wanted, but that's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for the huge part that you played in giving us Disneyland Paris. Oh, great. Really um, you talked about the dragon earlier, yeah. and I wondered if it has an identity, because there are two schools of thoughts amongst fans, yeah. one being Maleficent, yeah. and obviously the horns on the sign, and the other being that it's Merlin's dragon that he hatched. The and I'll song. give you another one. I think all of us <laughs> are inspired by what happened to us when we were 12. I, I call it that. It could be 11 or 12 or 13, whatever, but the things that really blew your mind at that age. You were old enough to be smart and not too old to be affected by hormones and all the things that kick in. So you're just like impressionable. And those things that, you, that happened to you that time stick with you ever. And so two things happened to me. Um, you know, the movie, you know, Sleeping Beauty and that dragon fight at the end, which is just unbelievable. And at the same time, there was another film uh, the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, and that was not a Disney film, but it had the most amazing fight between a, a dragon and a cyclops at the end of that. And Ray Harryhausen, the great animator, did that. And so both of those images happened to me at that same time, and I was obsessed with it. So when I did my portfolio before I worked at Disney, I was in college, I had the end of a major ride ending with a dragon guarding a treasure at the, at the thing. And they hired me to build models and stuff based on those portfolio pieces. And I often show that picture because it, it was done while I was in college and probably like 20 years before we did this. And, uh, but it, it staged almost the same way. 
And it was a cross between those two dragons. It wasn't exactly Maleficent, because that's a cartoon drawing, you know, and we wanted this to be kind of a real dragon. But one of the things I put in there that's from Sinbad is he's got a collar and he's broken the chain. And that's a key part in the movie, The Seven Voyage of Sinbad. And I got to see Ray Harryhausen when he was uh, doing a, a publicity signing thing for a book. And I said, if you ever get back over to Paris, be sure and see the dragon under the castle because I put that collar on it and the broken thing because of uh, your scene in the movie that you know inspired me so much when I was a kid. So he was excited about that. I don't know if you ever saw it, but uh, yeah, that was a giveaway for Ray. And uh, so, you know, I think it's, it's, it's all those feelings. And uh, I think we go back to those things. When you're a designer, you're, you're trying to, as an adult, rekindle all those things that were just so stunningly amazing to you when you were a child and that you want, want to revisit over and over again. And I wanted a dragon. And I don't know if I told it in here. Um, they, they weren't going to give us any credit about adding that. They said, well, it's not an attraction, it doesn't have a turn style, or it's not a ride, so you're just spending money. And I said, I think it's going to turn out to be a surprise. And when we did our guest surveys on the opening year, number one, Big Thunder, number two, Parts of the Caribbean, number three, The Dragon and the Castle. So I said, all right. So the public is really excited about that. And uh, I know that we just put a lot of effort into that, and he looks beautiful again. And so. I'm really excited to see you all in here.